right, wonderful, welcome. You're about to learn how to, using plant medicine, how to soothe your nerves and nourish your heart. I assume I'm in the company of beings on the spiritual path, having this physical experience. Those that are maybe a little bit more sensitive to kind of, you know, seeing, seeing feeling, hearing, tuning in. And uh, the plants that I'd like to share with you today are ones that can help you on your journey. Whether as a mom, whether as just a woman warrior day to day. I know we've all been through a lot the last few years and hopefully we're moving into a bit more kind of smoothness, but life doesn't guarantee us that, does it? <laughs> right? I think we signed up for the challenge, whatever comes our way, <laughs> we're ready for it. And uh, my name is Malcolm Saunders, and uh, I'm the owner and creative visionary of Light Cellar. And uh, yeah, I have a background in food, nutrition. My passion has always been how to show up and eat and consume foods that were in alignment with how I saw the world, right? Or as, or as Gandhi said, you know, be the change you want to be in the world. And originally, I thought that was being a vegetarian. You've probably heard that. I want to save the world, I want to be more green, I want to be more eco, become a vegetarian. Well, it took me more, long story short, it took me more, more than 10 years, almost 15 in fact, to realize I'm not meant to be a vegetarian. <laughs> and in fact, that idea of everything you hear about, kind of how noble it is to only eat plant-based is, is actually only a half-truth. Um, that's not going to be the topic of our discussion today, but just to kind of give you the, the framework of, from where I've come from, I was 16, time of your life, you're supposed to have all your youth, all your energy, and I could barely make it through a day. And uh, that was actually as a result of just one afternoon deciding, switching my diet from meat, potatoes, and junk food to just potatoes and junk food, because I was a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite a vegetarian, I was more of a carbitarian. <laughs> right, one sugar source after another, just trying to get enough energy to make it through the day. And that is what started me on my journey. So I'm grateful for it. And uh, now I fully embody the space of being a, uh, what my friend Yara Willard calls a, a flexitarian, an opportunivore. <laughs> yeah, and truly omnivore. A lot of what had kind of originally inspired my journey down that path was I was into yoga, I was into meditation, and it offers this idea of, uh, at least in Ayurveda, the idea of uh, sattvic food. You know, those are the foods that have kind of the most kind of spiritual quality and essence versus tamasic foods, which are maybe a little bit like heavy, they're dulling to the senses. Uh, kind of a quick, easy example of like something that would be tamasic would be like fried foods. You know, like you eat a lot of fried foods, you don't necessarily kind of spring up from the table and go, all right, I feel great. Your, your palate's been satiated, but there's, there's a bit of a kind of a heavier quality to it. And I'm not here to judge, oh, that's, that's a bad food. You shouldn't eat that, that, that food. Uh, we want to move away from that. And uh, I'm really into this idea of, of adding in and, and nourishing your body in the way that feels good and really being present with whatever you're eating and going, going deeper into the energy, the essence of, of what you're consuming. So there's tamasic foods, there's what we call rajasic foods, and uh, those things tend to be a little bit more uh, stimulating, right? Like spice, the spice of life, you know? Like they're, yeah, they might even light a bit of a fire, you know, inter internally, you feel the heat, uh, but there's also kind of that spice. And again, from my Ayurvedic pers perspective of, you know, the yogic life and, and the monk and the monastic and trying to balance and calm the mind, they would say, well, these can take away from your, your spiritual path, right? Maybe you've heard that in a lot of yogic traditions, they don't eat onions or garlic. Too rajasic, they say. I don't know, what's more stimulating? You know, walking down the street or watching Netflix or, you know, or eating onions and garlic. Um, some of these things come from another time, another period, and uh, yeah, we can all, take it as a, as a grain of dulse, as my friend likes to say, you know? <laughs> so this idea of sattvic is kind of more like the pure type foods. And, uh, you know, again, more for the yogi, uh, the meditator, the one that's a little bit more spiritually in tuned. And, you know, take that for what you will in terms of choosing the best that really nourishes your heart. And uh, though I've started talking about food and my backgrounds in food and nutrition, I've actually really, really come around uh, to seeing plants, not as an exclusive food group, 
right, plant only or even plant based, uh, this idea of omnivore, right? So within the Ayurvedic system uh, and yoga in general, right, they talk about some of these high states of like omnipotence, omniscience. And I was like, wait a minute, omnivore? Isn't that the greatest, the highest state <laughs> to be in, to consume all? And there are four food groups uh, that humans have consumed throughout the world, throughout time, every single culture around the world. And uh, it's not the ones you were taught in school. No, nope, not those ones. What were those? Grade two? You already kind of introduced. I don't even know. They keep changing it, right? The Canada Food Guide goes to all these iterations. Uh, but it does turn out that there are, in fact, four food groups. So we have plants. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll get into that one more specifically today and I believe the true role that it does play and can offer you. Uh, animal foods, be it, and that's a whole spectrum, just like there's, you can think of every kind of plant food you might consume, same with animal, food, animal foods. And what I love about this food guide, uh, ancestral food guide, we could call it, is that it doesn't tell you what to eat, when to eat, or how much to eat. That becomes the individual journey. This is the intuitive eating. All right, we've gotten so focused on, at least I did, and I see many others as well, like intellectualize, right? Okay, I gotta get this, I gotta get this much protein and this many carbs, and oh, I gotta reduce it down to that. And these antioxidants, quercetin, okay, where do I get quercetin? And how do I get that into my diet, right? It becomes this intellectual pursuit. Where it's like, what is a bioflavonoid? How can you really like connect to that on a deep cellular level, right? This intuitive eating, your instincts, which, drive you can guide you just as much as your intellectual rational mind. I know Western society says, you know, we're so great as humans because we have this capacity of intellect to be able to think, to ration, to reason. And it's true, like some of our greatest accomplishments as, as a species of humans have come out of that ability. But we forgot this other way of knowing, right? The more intuitive. And this is what we're here for, right? Connecting into that side, nourishing that side, and we can eat from that place, and we can use foods to nourish that space as well. Uh, so the food guide, so plants, animals, bacteria. Ooh, bacteria as a food group? All humans eat bacteria? Yes, we do. And especially bacteria that have transformed plant foods and animal foods. Did anybody eat ferments in the last week? Some yogurt or some sauerkraut? Yeah, these are the, the fermented foods transformed via bacteria. Absolutely key and essential food group. And it was only in our kind of modern industrialized society that we moved away from that. Advanced things of like refrigeration, things of uh, food preservation techniques, 24-7, uh, 365 supply chains where we can have whatever we want whenever we want. Wow, we don't need to ferment anymore, do we? Oh yeah, yeah, we do, <laughs> we're learning that one. So there's a resurgence back to those bacteria and just kind of a, just a little bit of a hook to think about. Uh, you are more bacterial cells than you are human cells and they mostly reside in your gut. I mean, they're inside of you, outside of you, all over you, in and out, but most of them in your gut. And oh, do you follow your gut? This idea of intuition, are you nourishing your gut? Who's calling the shots? Me as a vegetarian, the carbitarian was like, sugar, 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 sugar. <laughs> I think it was my candida talking, right? I had an imbalance of these bad bacteria to good bacteria, and that was driving more of my decisions, my cravings. And when we can kind of come back into balance, we can be, yeah, in a more wholesome state to retune and allow our guts to influence and inform our decisions. The fourth food group, or kingdom, you can actually call these a kingdom. Right? I know technically in biology there are six, but uh, these, are, these are the four food groups, uh, which are actually kingdoms of life, plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. Yeah, maybe you've been hearing about this idea of, of mushrooms. Yeah, the fungi. Oh, we just watched the fantastic fungi. Yeah, who else has seen that? It's on Netflix, that's, yeah. Wow, incredible. The future is fungi, the past is fungi, your present is fungi. Time to tune in. Yeah, totally. Um, so. Once we become aware of, of that being a framework of like, this is what humans eat, right? Then it becomes your own intuitive journey of like, okay, what from each and what role does each of those foods play in your diet? You know, every day, every week, which changes. So I wanna talk about plants and how I went from, you know, seeing that as, oh, I can only eat plants, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan to save the world, transcending that to actually the role that plants actually play. So yes, they are food, but they're also 
primarily medicine. And they are the most primary form of medicine that humans have had throughout time. Right? Herbal medicine is folk medicine. It's the people's medicine. Every single culture around the world has this relationship with plants. And in fact, a friend of mine, he defines herbalism as nothing more than the institutionalization of wild food intuition. Yeah, and that's, that's not good nor bad. It's just different. It's just what we humans do. And you can look at a Chinese system or an Ayurvedic system, uh, which were very good, very detailed in kind of mapping it out. They've got a long history you know, with the Chinese with writing, and they wrote it down, and they classified, and they categorized. And this was over hundreds, thousands of years that we have the incredibleness of that system. What is also just incredible, but maybe not quite as detailed in its uh, written form, is you know, the indigenous that lived here on this land, right? What was their relationship with the plants? How did they know what to eat? They didn't have grocery stores, they didn't have pharmacies, right? The land provided, and that was the same for every indigenous culture. Indigenous means to be of a place, to really be of the land and to work with it and engage with it and interact with it and be nourished by it and give thanks to it. So we're going to look at this path of, of herbalism. And within that, I mean, it's, it's huge, right? So as you think about, and as I invite you to be your own herbalist, to come back to this more ancient, more intuitive, nourishing path of self-care, of medicine, not to replace what we have in terms of modern medicine, right? We're there's, there's, a, there's a time and a place for both, right? Prevention, acute care, you know, whatever it is, just to have more in your toolkit. I mean, that's a very kind of masculine <laughs> analogy. Your purse, uh, literally, your, 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 your witch's uh, <laughs> cupboards. Yeah, we, we can all be that again for ourselves and for our children. And, uh, you know, when I first started in nutrition, I was, uh, I'd kind of chosen my path. I was like, all right, I'm going to be a nutritionist, and I'm going to go to school, and I'm going to study this. And, and I had friends. I mentioned his name already, Yara Willard. He's a second-generation herbalist. His father is uh, Dr. Terry Willard. He started the Wild Rose College uh, Natural Healing. He ran a clinic here for a while, that kind of a thing. And so he's one of my friends growing up, and I saw him uh, take the path of herbalism. You know, like, I was going to school for nutrition. He was going to school for herbs. And to be honest, I felt very intimidated about herbs. I did not grow up in this way. I mean, again, when I first shifted my diet, the extent of my culinary abilities where I knew how to make Pop-Tarts, grilled cheese, and microwave pizza. <laughs> that's where I started from. And that's where most of us start from, right? If you just kind of take on the societal norm of the day, uh, but how well has that served us? It really hasn't, actually. And we can see successively, generationally, uh, the problems that that's beginning to bring up. So I took it upon myself, okay, you know, I'm an adult, I'm going to learn how to feed myself, and yeah, it took me a long time, so that's kind of what I do, why I do what I do, is I want to, like, help uh, others on that path be a little bit, you know, quicker, faster, clearer, getting to that space uh, of, of intuitive eating and feeling really good about your body and the food that you eat, whatever it is. But herbs, it was like, oh, man, like, that's, that's a whole other degree, that's a whole other path. And then... A couple years down the road, a mentor of mine, Blaine Andrusik, says, Malcolm, he says, you can be a herbalist. You can be your own herbalist. He's like, think about it. And this is a man that had been practicing herbal medicine for several decades. He says, think about it. I'm a herbal practitioner. I'm just practicing. You can practice too. <laughs> right? And if you want to practice on other people, okay, maybe go to school, get the degree, you know, like have that knowledge. But for yourself, you can naturally begin to kind of just tune into this, just start connecting with plants. And there's a saying in herbalism that compliance is key, meaning the herbs don't work unless you take them. <laughs> That's number one. To being your own herbalist is actually to take the herbs. Uh, and so as we kind of explore this, wherever you're at, I mean, maybe this is completely brand new. Maybe you actually are a herbalist. You're trained. You probably know more than I do. You're sitting in this room. Who knows? Uh, I, w I wanted to share uh, a few plants um, that I've personally gathered, uh, sourced, uh, prepared into medicine, and uh, offer you an experience of, of the power of plant medicine. So does that sound good? Are you excited? <laughs> Let's just fit into the flow of the day and, and everything that... What a, what a beautiful scene, right? Yeah, thank you, Allison, for, uh, for organizing this and, and bringing us all together. So there are uh, 
one way to kind of approach herbs is you can think about maybe your own ancestry. You know, maybe you come from Eastern Europe, maybe you come from Africa, maybe you come from South America. And you think, you know, this is a way to really connect to my ancestry, my heritage. And you begin exploring those herbal traditions, the folk traditions that your people knew. Maybe you look at the land around us and you know what? I'm just so like in tune with this land. I love this land and I honor the people that lived here before I came. And I wanna learn how they approached the land and the plants that they knew. So that could be another way uh, to get into this and, and start to explore different traditions. But pick, you know, one herb at a time. Another way to get into it is to think about uh, different classes of herbs. So at the beginning I mentioned we're gonna focus on herbs that will soothe the nervous system because we live in this modern world and uh, yeah, just walking down the street can be jarring to the nervous system, <laughs> right? Living your life, raising children. Uh, I have two children. One is almost 18 and our second is almost three. So there's a big, got a big 15 year gap and it's been really fun and interesting and everything all the above, like going back on this path again. And uh, my wife has a friend that has two young ones and she's in Italy, so she calls like super in the morning. And uh, so we got woken up by the call and we're on the, like the FaceTime. And I mean, she's got uh, a nine month old and a three year old. And it was just like, ah, like just chaos on the other end, like the shrieking of the kid. I mean, they're having fun, right? They're being kids, but like that early in the morning, it was just like, ah, my nervous system. <laughs> can't handle it. <laughs> We've all had these moments. <laughs> and whether it's just the stressors of, of, of a job or everyday life, uh, or again, the past two years, what we've come out of, there's so many challenges, um, yet there are many plant allies that we can utilize and rely on uh, to help us on this journey. And specifically, they're called the nervines. Have you heard this term before? Yeah, so nervines, specifically, they help uh, or they have an action on the nervous system. And some of them are what we call anxiolytic, so they help reduce anxiety. Some of them are antidepressive. Some of them really are just more about like the stress response and normalizing and balancing that. You've just gone through that flight or flight, you know, you're still kind of hormones and everything are raging and it's just like, ah, helps you bring it back into balance, like clear out of that system. And uh, so whether you know the term or not, probably the most, does anybody know the most commonly consumed Nervine? Maybe in the world, definitely in North America. Chamomile is up there, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, I don't have any stats. I'm, I'm kind of, go, I'll, I'll share why I think this particular herb is, uh, you know, the most commonly consumed. But the types of Nervines, you have chamomile, you have valerian, you have lemon balm, you have Lavender, right? Yeah, there's so many different ones. And, and I used to work in the health food store. I mean, I, I own a health food store, but <laughs> when I was younger, out of school, uh, one of my first jobs was in a health food store, and I, I guess I never left. Um, it's been, yeah, way, way more than 20 years. And uh, we would have young mothers, like my friend, uh, wife's friend, that would come in like, ah, I'm a little stressed out. My baby's, you know, like colicky, like, what do you got? I need to like calm things down, smooth things out. And we're like, okay, come on over to the Nervines, right? And we'd introduce like, well, we got your valerian, we got lavender, we have chamomile. And chamomile's great, right? As that kind of just calming, soothing herb. And uh, it not only works on the nerv nervous system, what another system connected to the nervous system, the digestive system, right? Which is so affected, we get in that parasympathetic mode, sympathetic mode, the flight or fight. And uh, our nervous system, specifically the parasympathetic, the digestive system begins to like freeze up, right? It's like, well, we don't wanna put energy into that. We gotta, we gotta run. And uh, chamomile is actually very good and soothing for the digestive system as well. So anyways, number one herb I think that is probably the most consumed nervine that people don't even know is a nervine. <sighs> beer. What's the, what's the herb in beer? Hops, it's a Nervine, it's a sedative. Yeah, I mean, you've had a sip. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, it's calming, it's relaxing. Uh, and that was one of the ones we'd often go to for mothers is like, hey, have you tried hops? Especially if they were looking to increase milk production, uh, it has an effect uh, on the hormones as well. It's actually very estrogenic. Uh, and this is why 
Does anybody know any men that are, uh, we don't need to name names or anything, that are really like passionate about beer, but then tend to take on those secondary sex characteristics? Because it's very estrogenic. Yeah, this is what happens. So you as women, you know, you know, you go through these hormonal shifts, you know, through menopause, whereas men, we do too. We're just not as like, either not in tune about it enough or we just don't talk about it enough, but we go through andropause where our male hormones, testosterone begins to lower. And that's a dangerous time to start becoming a beer drinker because if you start loading the system full of estrogen, um, you know, which we have normally and there's a balance of, we can then get that imbalance. And when uh, beer was originally brewed, it was brewed by women and monks. We've heard this term the midwife right, which denotes an occupation. Uh, there was the alewife, right, the women that brewed the beer. They would go down into the hillsides and they would pick the local herbs and they'd make special brews. You went to the ale house for what ails you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, what was it, uh, 1516, a mandate Gosh, these mandates, right? These like decrees. If you were to make beer, it has to be made with, right? There was a law, the German Beer Purity Act, that said that beer had to be made with uh, water, barley, hops, and yeast. Up until that time, and it took a while to phase out some of the other uh, herbs that were being used. One of my favorite herbalists, Stephen Harrod Buner, he wrote a book called Sacred Herbal and Healing Beers. And it's as much a herbal textbook as it is the history of beers and ales and every other kind of fermented beverage of which all these different herbs were added to it, right? Hops, you know, its primary reason is, is as a preservative. Hence this idea of the IPA was the India Pale Ale because as beers were transported over long distances on ships, it would spoil, right? The regular amount of hops wasn't enough to preserve it. So they added extra hops, these IPAs, double IPAs, fresh IPAs, all this stuff has its roots in loading in more hops as a preservative to help get across that voyage. Uh, it also, from a flavor perspective, uh, bitters the beer. It's a very bitter flavor, right? And that's, that's the chemistry of that particular herb. Uh, and then the third, the unspoken component of this was that who else was, uh, was the brewer of beers? There were the women and the monks. Yeah. Now, what's the last thing you want on a monk's mind? Women. Yeah, and so there was a phenomenon known as the brewer's droop. <laughs> hops is an anaphrodisiac. You've heard of aphrodisiacs, right? It's like, woo, let's get the party going. <laughs> but yes, it's an anaphrodisiac. It was calming, it was sedative. There were other beers that was being brewed in the land, like the original Pilsner uh, had things like henbane. Uh, some of these beers were described as berserker beers were like literally like they would drink them going into battle or just drink them for like a big rowdy time uh, and that caught their shit disturbers you know it's like we want to like tone things down and so they started to mass influence how people were uh, getting medicated uh, and this is this has gone on for a long long time so anyways nervines um, there's many many different types of ones and they have a, an act on the nervous system among other benefits and influences. This is what I love about plants. They're dynamic, they're like people. You can't just put a person in a box, you are this. <laughs> a plant is not just this. It might have nervine qualities, it might have adaptogenic qualities, it might be good for the cardiovascular system. You know, there's probably a whole list of, of how it can help and influence your body. Uh, but nervines, they can definitely be felt. So lemon balm, this is one of my favorites. Uh, not only is it kind of calming and relaxing to the nervous system, it's also described as like sunshine. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see if you get that sense from, from taking it, right? Herbalism is a very kind of intuitive, you know, what, what's the chemistry that causes the sunshine in the body? <laughs> I don't know, I'm sure they've, they've you know, nailed it down, but it, it's a feeling we get, right? So as we enjoy these herbs, you know, tune into to the feeling of our intuition and our, and our bodies and how does it respond. Uh, so lemon balm, uh, yeah, it's that plant that when you rub it, it 
it smells like fresh, vibrant, like sunshine, lemons, brightness. Uh, I also grew some lime balm this year. So this is a tincture where I've combined both lemon and lime balm. And we'll just pass around if you would like to give this a try. Feel into the, the plant, this herbal medicine. There's two different ways you can take it. Uh, it is in a base of alcohol, which is used as a, as a solvent, as a way to pull and extract uh, herbal properties. I bet every single one of you, without even knowing it or realizing it, actually has a herbal tincture in your cupboard. That would be vanilla extract. Yeah, vanilla extract is a, yeah, a pure, <laughs> there we go, yeah. Yeah, so vanilla extract uh, is a form of, of herbal tincture, right? We put the vanilla beans, we don't have to think about the herbal components and properties of vanilla. It's got a lot of flavor, right? But tinctures, alcohol, will pull the flavor and the aromatic compounds and, and everything that's in them. Um, so it's maybe about 40%, uh, which again, I mean, if you were to go to the bar and get a shot of alcohol, like this is two ounces, right? You're not about to consume the whole bottle. I mean, you could if you want to have a good time, but uh, <laughs> herbs can work even just on a really kind of subtle level. So when you're taking tinctures, generally what's considered a therapeutic dose or a physical dose is, you know, you push the top there and it kind of like brings up uh, the liquid about two thirds through the dropper. That would be considered like a therapeutic, you know, physical dose. You can also do what's called uh, a drop dose, right? Which is literally just a drop. And I find this very helpful. It works, it's more than homeopathic, but it works kind of on a similar like energetic level, where especially once you're familiar with a particular herb, you know, all it takes is just like, ah, that little taste, right? It's like, ah, the body responds. It doesn't need such a huge amount. And then a third way you can take a tincture is maybe what could be described as like a, a macro dose, you know, a large dark dose. And I often give example of, um, there's a lot of kind of immune uh, supportive herbs like echinacea, you know, medicinal mushrooms. Uh, they each act in their own way, but I have certain tinctures that you can take when on the first onset of a cold, right? That like tickle on the throat, you're like, ah, okay, I kind of feel something. You know, that might be when you want to like dose up on the herbs. You know, you're going to the office, you know, or your kids are home from school and they're always bringing stuff back. Uh, you can kind of amp it up a little bit. It's like, it's maybe where you do take the shot, you know? <laughs> maybe you go through the whole bottle, not in a day, but you know, over three or four days, just to really kind of you know, get at it, support your body. Um, so today, I, I leave that to you uh, to kind of do option one or two, which is a full kind of therapeutic dose, um, of which we'll just kind of give a little bit of room from our mouth, and then you can shoot that in. Or if you just want to have a little taste, you can literally just put a drop or two in the back of your hand see what you think. So yeah, really tune into the flavor, really tune into the feeling of this herb and uh, see what you think. There's no right or wrong uh, about how you experience this. So what's the difference between the tincture and the tincture? Because I have not seen the difference. Okay. I mean, the tincture is expensive. For sure. But what's the difference between the balm, which we're ingesting it, right. and Okay, right on. Uh, I'm just going to repeat the question because I'm doing a little recording and you'll, you'll be able to listen afterwards. And uh, so, okay, question was, uh, you're making some lemon tea or lemon balm with your? Lemon loaf. Lemon loaf, okay, great. And you used essential oils? I did not. Oh, you did not. All right, okay, so there are. For sure, yeah, okay, so when it comes to essential oils, um, you wanna think of a couple of things. So we're first, where they come from is those aromatic compounds, right? When you rub the lemon balm leaf, or you come across hops and you smell it, or peppermint, right? It's those aromatic volatile compounds that you breathe in, they're just naturally releasing. This is one of the reasons why it's so nice to be in a forest, because they're constantly just releasing these chemicals, these essential oils into the air. Uh, they volatilize off and humans have figured out uh, ways to kind of capture those and so it's through uh, distillation that we've got essential oils. Uh, so that's first and foremost how they're produced and it's, it's primarily, well it is, it's oil based uh, versus an alcohol which will pull some of the water soluble compounds, it'll pull the essential oils, it all goes in, uh, whereas essential oils just a very particular fraction of it. Um, depending on how it's done, how it's made, you know, quality, purity, that type of thing, you could absolutely consume lemon essential oil, orange essential oil, peppermint essential oil, lemon balm essential oil, any of those 
totally good, totally safe. Um, did you know, actually know who is the largest consumer of essential oils as an industry? No, so as an industry. Ah, it's actually the candy industry. Yeah, like think of like candy, right? Like peppermint, like gum and that type of thing. They're getting that from essential oils. And yet, then they have the audacity to say, oh, don't consume essential oils. Like, that's natural. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, quality number one. Uh, and then, of course, make sure it's an appropriate herb. Some herbs are actually not meant to be ingested. Uh, they're great, you know, as essential oils, like aromatically. Um, actually, this might be a good time to introduce this. So I brought, um, this is what's called a hydrosol. So a hydrosol is a, a hydro, like water solution of uh, plant aromatics like the essential oils still dissolved in, in the water. So normally uh, uh, essential oils are skimmed off the top uh, to capture and gather those essential oils where this is just them still in water. And it's a mix, I call it the forest essence. Last time I was in BC, I harvested um, Western red cedar, white pine, Douglas fir, and hemlock. So it's kind of like, bring in the forest in, internal forest bathing. Uh, now, Western red cedar, its essential oil is not recommended to be consumed internally because it has a compound call, called thujone, which can be liver toxic. Uh, so, you know, this one I just recommend just to spray it aromatically, right? And you'll, you'll, you'll smell, you'll sense those, those essential oils. So it depends on the plant and the essential oil that you consume it. And then, of course, really look for quality as well. Yeah, an amount. Um. Oh, really good question. So how long does it take to make the tincture? So if you, you can make a tincture from fresh or dried plant material, you're gonna, and here's the kind of quick, easy herbal hack. Uh, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow called the Complete Herbal Medicine Making, and it's three hours, and tincture is one of the steps we'll go through. But to kind of give the quick, quick and dirty of how to do it, is you take a plant material, uh, anything, stick it in a, in a jar, whatever size you want. And of course, the more plant material you have, the more concentrated it'll be. And sometimes with vanilla beans, all it takes is like three vanilla beans in a, in a little 250 mil jar. And then you pour vodka over top, you put a lid on top, and then you let it sit for minimum two weeks. Yeah. And you, you can get really esoteric about it, like, okay, it's gonna be from a new moon to a full moon, or you go like a full moon cycle, or you wanna do a year, that type of thing. There's a lot of different nuances, but that's kind of the basics, is just herb in a jar, vodka, two weeks. It doesn't have to be a year. Yeah. Nice. Okay, yeah, so you might come across uh, recipes that are specific, like vanilla, okay, six months to a year. Yeah, and you probably already noticed, like, it's probably dark, it probably smells, it probably tastes good. Yeah, and yeah, maybe that six months is just allowing it a much deeper time to, to extract and more, uh, pull more fully. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you don't have to wait a year, that's straight. Okay, cool. Uh, so Nervines, th there's many different ones, you know, we've, and there's many different forms you can take them in. Like I, I even have lavender essential oil. Uh, here is rose hydrosol. Rose isn't necessarily um, a Nervine, but it's, it's very calming, it's very soothing, right? We just know like that connection to our emotion, to our hearts, uh, which is maybe we'll kind of transition from Nervines into another type of class of herbs, at least defined by the Chinese, that nourishes the heart. So we'll, we'll pass the rose around, you can spray that and enjoy that. And uh, in Chinese herbal medicine, they call these the Shen tonics. Now, no doubt you've heard the term Qi, right? Um, there is, you know, Qi Gong. And Qi loosely is translated as, as energy. Uh, Ayurveda, maybe they interpret that more as like prana. And it's, you know, daily physical energy in the sense like we can get Qi from learning how to, you know, do exercises, harness that Qi. Oh, okay, this is a great comment. Uh, so she said that her mother used the, r the rose water for wrinkles. It's amazing for wrinkles. So I mentioned uh, one of my mentors, Blaine Andrusik. Uh, 
yeah, he's, he's got to be into sing his 60s, but his, ba his face is like as smooth as a baby's bottom. <laughs> and he said, but it's the rose water. Uh, so his ritual is, you know, you're in the shower, and with that heat, generally it, it opens up your pores, yeah. right? You're sweating, that type of thing. And uh, maybe you're into the Wim Hof, you do the hot cold, the hot cold. But generally, most of us, we come out of a nice hot shower, these open pour pores, and uh, the rose uh, has astringent qualities. Now, astringent, you've, you've all experienced this, is when you've eaten like an unripe persimmon or something that just kind of makes your mouth like, like tighten and pucker. Maybe something that's unripe. Uh, this is an energetic or a quality in, in herbal medicine. Yeah, and it works. So it, it tightens and it tones the tissues. And uh, rose can work like that uh, externally, topically. OK, so uh, chi. Chi um, is this energy that we get you know, fr from breath, right? Like it's just the air, like through breathing exercises, we can increase our chi, increase our prana, harness that energy. Um, there are also certain foods and certain herbs that are described as, as chi tonic, right? So this idea of like a, you take a tonic, right? It's very toning to the body, influences the, the energies of the body. And uh, chi is energy. We consume food, we breathe air. That is to kind of nourish our daily energy, our daily chi. Now, of course, we know we can get depleted in that. Sometimes around 2 o'clock, you know, you start to feel a little tired. Like, oh, I need a nap. I need a little bit of a recharge. And uh, but you live in today's modern world, there's no time, you've got kids, you've got work, uh, no time for a nap, so you keep going. And uh, amazingly, you kind of power through it, right? And it's like, whew, you found that second wind. Now, where did that come from? <laughs> now, this is what the Chinese would describe as, as Jing energy, you know, kind of more deeper core primal energy. And they say that, you know, you're born with a certain amount of Jing and your chi you're getting from every day, like, like, you know, doing exercises, eating, breathing to kind of constantly recharge and rebuild that. But we deplete it, and when we deplete it, and then we tap into our deeper reserves, that adrenal energy, that deep uh, kidney energy, they describe that as as jing. So if we were to personify uh, these terms into, you know, characters, right? So like chi, you could describe as like a rock star, you know, like living the life, like explosions, like. You know, <laughs> Dragon Ball. <laughs> totally, right? Chi energy, and then Jing. That might be personified as like, you know, the ninth round of a fight, right? Like these guys have been going like hardcore so long, but who's got the most staying power? At some point, somebody's gonna like just falter, and that other person's gonna take the edge. Uh, it's the mother, you know, <laughs> who's got four children. You know, it's like. The husband's away, all her support systems are away. She's just got to keep going, keep going. Uh, you're, you're tapping into that jing, that deep uh, kind of primal uh, energy reserves. Now, there's a third quality they described as shen. Now, shen is, can be interpreted in different ways. Um, maybe we'll cut right to the personification. You might describe the Dalai Lama as having a lot of shen, right? And it's more kind of that spiritual energy, that kind of emotional stability. So he's a little bit kind of like wigged out, a little sketchy, you know, like, yeah, there's not a lot of Shen going on. You don't get a good vibes from them, right? But you get good vibes from somebody that's got Shen. And so not only were they able to kind of recognize and talk about these uh, qualities, these energies, but they also began to connect foods and herbs to each of those. So there's something uh, that are called Qi tonics. So like cordyceps, which is a medicinal mushroom, is described as a, as a chi tonic. And a lot of athletes have used it for you know, performance, for energy. Uh, people also use it for the, uh, you know, the, the bedroom sports. It's, it's a great aphrodisiac. <laughs> cordyceps is also sometimes known as cordyceps-y. Um, <laughs> chi tonic. Uh, jing tonics, things like um, Heishu Wu, or if we take another uh, medicinal mushroom, Chaga. Uh, a friend of mine, he often describes uh, Jing foods as things that have that are black. You know, like black beans, black rice has more Jing in it than brown rice or white rice. Um, shen, rose, I would describe as a Shen tonic, right? It's 
it has that kind of otherworldly, like ethereal, very emotional kind of nourishment and, and connection. Uh, there are a lot of other herbs. Uh, this one here is maybe one of my favorites. Uh, so it's called the Albizia flower. And somebody I know, Ron Teagarden, uh, turned it into a little uh, tincture. He calls Shen Drops. And, you know, working in a health food store down on Bonas Road there, uh, I've seen a lot, especially in the last couple of years. Um, I've used this particular tincture at least three times now to calm people out of a panic attack right, like full-blown anxiety, they come in like wigged out, like, ah, what do you got? And I'm like, oh, come on here, it's all good, you know, H have some of this. Uh, another example was a woman had come to the elixir bar and she ordered a chocolate drink, chaga, chocolate, all these things that we put in our drinks, and it's very strong, right? I mean, you think of chocolate, what we're using is, is kind of the real whole food, the original stuff, and uh, quite a bit of it, and she was more sensitive to chocolate, so she's drinking her drink, she's like, I'm feeling a little bit, you know, like, she's like, ah, this has totally ungrounded me. I'm not used to chocolate. Like, what do you got to kind of chill this out? And uh, I was like, okay, no worries. I'll, I'll, I thought about this, and I was like, I'll bring over the Albizia for you. And uh, so I put just a little bit in water, and she drank it. And in English wasn't her first language. I, I, don't, I don't know where she was from, European. And uh, she's like, oh, oh, well, thank you. She's like, you know that thing, like how you make tea? Like, you know, like you push the thing. <laughs> Oh, the, the bodum, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, I feel like this calm just coming over me like that. <laughs> She's like, cool, that's, that's a great analogy. Um, so, yeah, try this. This is one of these ones, again, similar to rose, similar to lemon balm. Like, you try it, and you're like, ah, something is different. A little bit of quality about that to it. Um, so that's all called Albizia. Yeah, really good question. Okay, so one of my favorites uh, for adrenals, I've, I've got two here, and um, there's, there's lots uh, that you can look to. Uh, specifically, I would say um, the class of herbs called the adaptogens. Yeah, so they literally help your body to adapt, um, primarily to stressors, right? Physical stress, chemical stress, that type of thing. Uh, help normalize uh, body function and they're kind of broad in their action versus like, it's gonna do just this. Uh, you know, like work on your blood pressure. It will have an effect and more of a normalizing effect. Um, they're what we call dual directional. And I always like to use the immune system as a way to describe that dual directional because most of us, we have at times underactive immune system, right? It's like, ah, you know, the immune system, it's struggling, it's challenging. Uh, and we can take herbs that help stimulate or bring up our immune system. Now, those types of herbs you wouldn't want to give to someone with an autoimmune, would you, right? Because they have an overactive immune system, right? And you're just going to send it more into hyperdrive. Not good. Uh, but with adaptogens uh, or any of the medicinal mushrooms, they're actually dual directional. So whether you're underactive or overactive, it helps bring it into balance. And uh, so it's not just the immune system, but it's many of the other systems that they help bring your body in, into balance around. Uh, so I really love these two. Uh, one is called holy basil, and this is different than your culinary basil. Uh, originates uh, kind of from Ayurvedic tradition, although you can find the plant, you know, especially these days, being grown all and used all around the world. Um, you know, similar to this kind of Shen sattvic quality, uh, it's very soothing, calming to the nervous system. Not a, not in a drowsy way. Like it's not like a sedative, like hops is, uh, but it is very relaxing and it's restorative to the adrenals. Uh, same with uh, rhodiola as well. Yeah, great question. So holy basil is one that you can have before bed as well as in the morning. You can actually take it any time. Uh, there's another great herb that people really enjoy called ashwagandha. Maybe you've heard of that one as well? Ashwagandha, yeah. So some people will specifically take that before bed because it helps them get into a nice, like, deep sleep. Uh, the, the tagline for ashwagandha is it gives you the strength and stamina of the stallion. <laughs> and uh, that can be interpreted two ways. Is, is one way of, like, really helping in that deep restorative sleep so you wake up with that energy. But you can also take it in the day uh, to kind of, you know, support energy levels. And similar with holy basil. So... Okay, great question. Yeah, uh, whenever you research, you know, 
is such and such safe for pregnancy or breastfeeding? I mean, even water comes with a disclaimer. <laughs> like, uh, and I get it. Uh, no, nobody wants that liability. They're always that, you know, um, erring on the side of caution. And it's primarily because there haven't been a ton of studies, naturally, rightly so, on pregnant women to say definitively this is good or not. However, we can look to cultural tradition, you know, history, what herbs have been used. And we have a fantastic book uh, called The Complete uh, Women's Herbal. And uh, it's a, by a woman named Aviva Ram. And she really breaks down herbs for every single kind of phase and life cycle uh, for women, including pregnancy, breastfeeding. And so I would reference that book. Holy Basil, I want to say yes, but I don't know 100% for sure. I'm pretty sure that one is, is safe, but I'd have to refer back. Because th there's the odd one where it's just like, oh, uh, you know, it, in, it inhibits prolactin, so your, your milk flow might decrease if you're taking Macuna as, as an example. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, what about cooking them all then together? Okay. Maybe not the exact same time, but just Right. Like yeah, yeah, for sure. Really good question. Yeah. With the adaptogens, because they are more about working with the body in the state that you're in, uh, being non or dual directional, they, they can be great taken with other herbs, combined with other adaptogens, and that's where you can see a lot of formulas that herbalists have developed combining the two. Um, yeah, and there's a real art form to that, knowing the kind of the properties and the actions of the herbs and bringing them all together. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned my friend Yarrow, he thinks about you know these herbal blends as in tribes. You know, it's like, okay, you got your chief herb and your warrior herb and you this and that. And uh, so absolutely, there can be real power in, in blends. And some herbs can, you know, not so much cancel each other out, but they're, they work against each other, right? Imagine taking a really stimulating, energizing herb <coughs> along with a nervine, right? But actually, sometimes that works. You know, the Albizia that I passed around, uh, a friend of mine, you know, occasionally he'll drink coffee. He loves the taste, but it just sometimes, like, you have too much or you're not enough in your stomach. Like, it can take him just over the, over the edge. So he'll actually, he's waiting in line to get his coffee. He'll take a little bit of that Albizia, has his coffee. It, it never kind of wigs him out. Like it, it does provide that nice little balance. So yeah, and, and this is, you know, the finer nuances of being your own herbalist, right? As you go down this path, it's like, oh, well, what about that? And, you know, some herbs take a, a lifetime of study to, to really learn and understand uh, their energetics. And that's why starting small, starting simple, you know, one at a time, as well as in within the classes of, of adaptogens, you know, which are generally safe, which are these non, you know, dual directional uh, approach and, and properties. Like it's it's a good way to go. The tonics you can take them every day. Where there's some herbs, you know, they're they're medicinal, but they're medicinal in a way that you don't want to take long term, right? Let's say you have high blood pressure, so you take a herb that specific action is to help lower your blood pressure. Right? Well, if you keep taking that herb, you found some balance, you've done some lifestyle switches, you know, some diet, so on and so forth, but you keep taking the herb, it's like, oh, I suddenly have low blood pressure. <laughs> right? You're not titrating the dose. Uh, and that's where it's helpful always to work with a guide, you know, work with an experienced herbalist. But the things like the adaptogens and the tonics, it's a little bit easier uh, approach. I've been doing that for months. Yeah. Oh, vanilla extract. Totally amazing. Yeah. So vanilla extract as a way to balance blood pressure. Amazing. I know. Yeah. These these are kind of like these folk remedies. Like people knew, right? They they knew. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting flavor, eh? That one. Yeah. It's potent. Yeah. It, it's got a bit of a zing to it, but it's got this like nice floral. It's like it's like a hug, you know. It feels feels really good. <laughs> Dragon, yeah. I mean, that's that's the name of the company, and it's uh, you know symbology in in a lot of Chinese culture. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Just I, I, so with autoimmune yeah. The adaptogens only go safe because of that dual. That's right. Yeah. So good question. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you know, again reference your herbal books or work with a practitioner, especially if you're on medication for it mm -hmm. and how that might influence. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea of those adaptogens are, are definitely uh, safer and a, a better place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I wonder, like, since we're talking about music as well, and that's a core part of your musicianship and everything that you do so well, is there other, like, ways that you can go to next in terms of inspiration? And, like, what else would you recommend for yeah. people trying to do Okay, that? right on. Love that. So the role of Rose, uh, having that kind of, yeah, feminine, nurturing uh, energy to it. Amazing. That's really wonderful and good for that. I, I would say the Albizia to, uh, to, a, to a degree has that as well. Uh, I'm just thinking of some of the different herbs. I would put holy basil in that category as well. That is, yeah. And so the Chinese might describe it as something that's more yin or more yang. Um, yeah, I would say... Um, Shizandra, I would probably put in into that. Uh, reishi mushroom uh, in that category. And coming back to like the Jing, the Qi, and the Shen, there's certain herbs of which in the Chinese system, they, they may have, they have more than hundreds. Maybe they have thousands of different herbs that they've classified into that system. There's actually only, I think it's like 70 that are considered tonics or superior herbs that have these adaptogenic-like qualities. Uh, and a only a handful of those 70s that can be considered what they call three treasure tonics. So they're nourishing to Jing, to Qi, and to Shen. Uh, both Shizandra and Reishi are, uh, would be considered that. So I would put uh, Reishi as something that would, you know, pair really nicely with Rose and has more of that, that quality. So I'll, I'll make you a drink right now that uh, almost brought the blender to, I, I left it in the car, but I'll, I'll kind of whip it up by hand here and, and give you something that's uh, a nice Shen tonic, you know, like nourishing to the heart, relaxing, and uh, yeah, that, that feminine essence. What's the name of this This one here? It's called Reishi. Yeah, so that's, so is this? yeah, let's pass that around. <laughs> uh, so that's exactly what it would look like if you found a Reishi mushroom in the forest. It grows on uh, trees, like wood, yeah, as the substrate. So it's not something that just kind of pops out the ground, uh, emerges out of, out of trees, and hence why it's, it's, it's tough, it's woody. Let me pass that around and you can, uh, all right. Okay, so I brought some hot water, and uh, we're gonna do it the old-fashioned way. I wasn't sure if there would be electricity in this uh, nice little space, so I left the blender in the car, but I brought it just in case, and I brought a few things that we can uh, add to our drink here. Um, yeah, okay, so we have some reishi, some mushroom, a three treasure tonic, uh, great as an immune modulator, balancing that immune system, uh, it's considered a heart tonic, great for uh, blood pressure and that whole system. I have uh, a wild rose syrup, so these are roses that I was out in the hills every day in the summer, picking wild rose petals <laughs> and then extracted into honey. Oh, it's, it's lovely. Is that available? Yeah, in, it's available in very limited quantities. <laughs> it was a labor of love for sure to, to pick this one. So we're going to add some of that. Um, actually, we'll add a little bit of the Shizandra. Um, this one's interesting. It, uh, again, three treasure tronic, but also described as the five flavor fruit. So it has all five flavors. We know that different flavors have different effects on different uh, organs and body systems, right? Most notably bitter, really good for digestion, stimulates the, the gallbladder. Uh, this one's got all five flavors. Primarily, uh, it has the flavor of, of sour, like kind of the first thing that you'll, you'll notice. Sorry, what was it called? Shizandra. Shizandra. Shizandra, or I like to say Shizamdra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is another one actually that uh, in kind of like the Chinese herbal, you know, mythology, they, they personify as like the queen, you know, this kind of eternal youthful queen. Uh, it's about beauty, it's about clear radiant skin, it's about, you know, clarity of, of uh, eyes and yeah, it nourishes the Jing, the Qi and the Shen. Uh, you know, we talk about that two, you know, 2 p.m. crash, middle of the day. I mean, go ahead, have, have a nice little shot of this. Be prepared for sour. That's like, wow, Shazam, like it, <laughs> it wakes you up. And did you bring any to sell? I didn't bring any to sell, no. Yeah, just, <laughs> just to share and to sample. All right. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're, I'm gonna add uh, just a little bit of salt. Salt is actually really good for the adrenals uh, and restorative that way. Plus, good for the, the flavor. Oh yeah, really good question. So this is Morton's iodized salt? No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> this one actually, this is this is beautiful. I'll pass it around. Um, this is a uh, a cypress pyramid salt. Um, so it's sea salt flakes from some cypress that are literally in the shape of little tiny pyramids. So if I'll pass, I'll include the spoon. You can pass it around. I, I just did a video yesterday um, on the Light Soil YouTube channel, which was uh, you know what type of salt is best for fermenting, and I talked about all the different types of salts, and I mentioned that one. I was like. That's not a good salt for fermenting because <laughs> it, it's such a beautiful like finishing salt and, and it's fairly dear. It's, it, it's expensive um, compared to, you know, a good high quality like rock salt or ocean salt like a Himalayan or Redmond or that type of thing where in fermentation you're using tablespoons at a time. Um, okay, and some more things here. Okay, so we've got our wild rose syrup. We have a little bit of salt. We've got our Shizando tincture. We've got some reishi uh, extract. This one here is a blend uh, by a man named George Lamoureux, uh, PhD in Chinese uh, herbal medicine doctorate. And he created this formula called Awaken the Shen, or Peaceful Spirit. Uh, so it's specific herbs that nourish that, right? Nourish and open the heart, calms emotional stress, emotionally uplifting, nurtures the spirit. And it's got reishi, which we've talked a little bit about, albizia, which we've talked a little bit about and you've experienced, and then some other uh, Shen tonics. So asparagus root, polygala root, pearl powder, like literally pearls. Um, what's that? Making a bomb. Yeah, it's a heart bomb. <laughs> uh, long end fruit, which is really good for building the blood. Uh, there's a couple other medicinal mushrooms. There's schizandra. There's, there's a few things in there. So, all right. Yeah, we want you. We want you feeling good here. And, uh, <laughs> the Shizandra, what was the question about bitter? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm going to have to do this the old fashioned way. You know, before blenders, we had whisks, <laughs> right? Or in Mexico, it was, uh, I'm, I'm really into chocolate. I, I did bring a couple of books if anybody's interested. I've written a book on elixirs, which is kind of what I'm doing here. Um, you know, crafting these uh, kind of herbal beverages. And then also wrote a book on chocolate, which, you know, the Molinillo was the original blender to mix up the chocolate drinks. All right. And uh, not only am I big into uh, intuitive eating, I'm also big into intuitive chefing, right? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. <laughs> so we'll, yes, using the intuition, we'll, uh, we'll see what we get. All right. So this, so I just brought some hot water and then I'm, I've brought different uh, extracts, like we have the tinctures. Um, when it's in this powder form, it's just been extracted either hot water or as a tincture and then just dried back to a powder so that when you add it, uh, it just becomes like instant tea, essentially. And it goes. All right. So this, this is me, this is my world. I get to have fun, you know, playing with herbs and, and teaching people. Uh, tomorrow I'm doing a, a three hour, what I call the complete herbal medicine making course. Um, so it's, you can join online or in person. Yeah, either or. Oh, okay, I see, thank you. <laughs> Carla's watching out for me here. Yeah, so all the classes are at Light Cellar, which is down along uh, Main Street, Boness. Yeah, and uh, so we've got uh, a store where you'll find, you know, all kinds of uh, different herbs and foods and everything from around the world. Uh, and then we have an elixir bar. We have a production kitchen where we're making chocolate. We're making um, ferments, things like sauerkraut, um, fermented hot sauce, you name it. And then we also have our, our teaching kitchen uh, where you can learn how to, you know, make elixirs, make 
healthy chocolate, that kind of a stuff. So, and that was just a little bit more honey, just to kind of sweeten it. Yeah. Yeah. The only sweetness we'd added was just a little bit of that rose syrup. So I'm just kind of. Or I brought glasses, so it's up to you. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I think got some glasses down here. Oh, yeah. So every year we do a fermentation festival. Uh, so this year it's going to be the fifth annual, and it's from November 14th to 18th. And that can be uh, joined online or, or in person. So, and it'll just be at Light Cellar. What time is the tomorrow? One till four. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I was leading a lot of plant walks this summer where we'd, uh, every week we'd take a group out. Oh, not that I'm teaching, but so, but there are a few other instructors. 